Bingo. Okay, so I've got some stuff on the machinery handbook that I want to go through. Now, the machinery handbook that is on Canvas is a 29th edition. These ones are 30th editions. That's a 31st edition. You might have your own. I have a 24th edition, my own personal one. So the page numbers are going to be slightly different. These will all be the same. So whether it's a big book like this or it's a small book, um, they will be the same on page numbers. So if I go to 1109, looking at speeds and beats, you'll be your same 1109. The 29th and the 31st, they'll be small variations. Like my own personal ones, they'd be a, a small variation too. So um, one of the things that you got to pay attention to um, when you're, especially if you're in the shop, you're going to have, everybody's going to have some type of machine or handbook, but it's going to be so many different generations of them because they make a new one every year to two years, depending on, um, depending on what's going on or what changes that they make. Um, these books are about the small ones and the big ones. I think both are about a hundred bucks a piece. So you don't typically buy them all the time. You buy one and you just live with the changes because the changes that they make are pretty minor. Um, but industrial press who makes this, they're, they're putting one out every couple years. That way new people who come into the industry are getting the newest edition. I know a bunch of people who collect them a bunch. I know three people who collect them who have them all the way down to the original machinery handbook that is like this thick. Um, it's got like blacksmith stuff in it. And I mean, it's cool if you want to collect some things like that. I don't. But, um, you know, if you're historical like that and want those kinds of things, it's, it's pretty neat. So machinery handbook oftentimes is um, people shy away from it because they're like, I'm going to Google it. And I'm a huge fan of Googling it. But the problem with Google, or just doing, doing any kind of internet search, is it's not necessarily the standard, and you can get anybody's interpretation of any anything, or you could accidentally look at the wrong thing. So let's just say I wanted to know the minor diameter on a um, two a half thirteen two B, and so what I would I might go look at a drill tap chart. And it says, well, you want to drill at 2764s. 2764s is the drill diameter for that, but it's not necessarily the minor diameter for it. So it's important to, to know the differences between the two. So just so we can have it on, on screen while we're recording, um, I want to have this one up here. And so generally speaking, you're going to find... Um, about the same information on any of them. And they go from things that you're going to need all the time. Moments of inertia, probably not a big one for people to use. Um, but you're going to find your categories in like the threading areas, which are going to be somewhere around the, oh, probably 1800s or so. Again, my own book, it's 1600s. Here's a good one. So you got different style of, uh, hex heads tells you what kind of torque ratings and how much pressure that they can handle. Um, let's see. Keep going down a little bit more. So if you find a threading section in yours, And, and really, one of the reasons that you're going to find not a lot of information on a screw, like when you go to make a screw, you're not going to find a ton of information about it because it's already given to you as standard. So when it says half 13 or 3816 or um, M10, those are already those are already things that are established. So they don't need to come up with a, a, an individual pitch diameter and everything for each one because we have the standards to work off of. All right, so anything from, like here are socket head cap screws. It's so like you'll notice whenever I have you do counterbores, I don't tell you what typically what size the counterbore should be. So you should be able to go back and reference this and say, okay, so 
this is the head size um, A, and then I can go into the machinery handbook and find counterbore sizes for them. So here we go, counterbores for that. If it's a, let's say the screw thread is a quarter 20, and then it's going to give you the size in B of your counterbore size. So, so this is what your counterbore size then should be. So that, that way I don't have to continuously say, hey, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. That way I can just say, hey, do a counterbore for this. Or if I want to have a countersink, countersink by standard is an 82 degree included angle. And I should say, I could be able to say, or should be able to say, uh, we need to do a uh, quarter 20 uh, countersink for a flathead. And then you can go into here and see the specifications for that. So I don't think that anybody ever assumes that you would memorize all of these things. I think over time, you'll pretty quickly be able to figure out where these things are in your book. I don't have my book in here. Um, but I have little tabs. Um, I mean, I have the original like factory book tabs, but I also keep um, little like post-it tabs in mind so I know where everything's at. And I just I've written lots of notes in it. When you go to take your NIMS test, you cannot have you cannot take anything other than a machinery handbook, a piece of paper a writing utensil, and a, um, and a calculator. So that means you can't take any additional notes or anything else with you. Now, my own unofficial statement for that is I've had lots of people who put, I missed, I missed the page. Um, I've had lots of people who put notes inside of their book on post-its, like 1800 is the page for this, 4200 is the page for this, or a specific formula, and they've never said anything about it. I don't know that I think that that's necessarily right or wrong. No one's ever said if it was right or wrong. So um, when you go down to take your NIMS test, and you want to know things like threads, um, I think that it would be, I think if it were me, I would go ahead and take the chance of um, having a note in there about my, about the things that I wanted to know. So um, it'll, it'll be helpful for you because you guys are getting ready to take I'm scheduling NIMS test today. So should have those pretty soon. All right. So I'm, Trying to find my regular threads, measuring screw threads. What's that? Are you going to it's the National Institute for Metal Metalworking Skills. So we took a we took a cause test in CNC, and so we'll take the NIMS test here. It's a you'll take the test at the testing center, and you will you get 90 minutes to take. Um, it's about 50 questions. I'll give you like a practice test on it before. And then um, you go in there, take the test, and um, and it's either it's either so it scores you, and, and then depending on where you are, um, what which test you're taking, it'll tell you you know 87 percent passing or 50. 4% of passing, depending on which one it is.
so used to my book. Like in my own personal book, all of those areas where I use all the time, the outside of the pages are really dirty, so I can find them really fast. Okay, so if you have this, if you have this book, the 30, um, go to about page 1869. Um, Penny, yours will probably be closely around there. The top of it is going to say uh, unified screw threads. Let me see if I can get over to this one. I'm going to say it's probably close in this one as well. So they, have an index. they have an index. Yeah, as I was gonna say, it's it's pretty it's pretty healthy. So in this one, this is an older book, and it is eighteen twenty. Yeah, unified screw threads. So on this one, it's 1823. So somewhere around that 1800 range. You're looking for some charts that look like this. There you go. So if you need to make a, a set of screw threads. And so really, this, this really plays into not so much um, for the threads that you've done, which I'll probably have you go ahead and grab yours, and then we'll do some thread measuring as we as we go this morning. Um, but if, if I say make a, go to something just a little bit bigger than what that is. So we did a half 13 on ours. On the end of our hammers. So that will be all of this information. Okay. So it's half 13 UNC, Unified National Course. And then it's a 1A, 2A, or 3A fit. A always means that it's external. And so we want to stay over here on this external side, not looking over here on this side. Tell us what we have for a thread allowance. Our major diameter, our pitch diameter, and our minor diameter. Minor diameter is really a reference because if you get the major diameter right, you get the pitch diameter right, minor diameter has to fall in. So half 13, we are not going to turn to a half inch. It's got to be smaller than that. So we, we, we did that on ours. We turned it smaller. So 498.5 would be the high side, 482.2 would be the low side. We turned ours to about 490, 495. And so um, then you move over. When we put our threads on there, the pitch diameter is between 448 and 441. The pitch diameter is a halfway point between the threads. So this halfway point. Halfway point between the Good threads. Not, that's not gonna 
not screwing into anything. <coughs> this, the outside of it is the major diameter. This is the minor diameter. This area right here is a pitch diameter. Okay, so it's the midpoint between the major diameter and the minor diameter. It's really the engagement part of the thread. You can have your minor diameter too deep. You can have your major diameter too, too small. As long as the pitch diameter is right, you're good to go. Now, if, if your minor diameter is too small, chances are your pitch diameter is too small too because it, the V thread, it creates the thread like that. But let's just say you had some kind of really crazy tool that made an undercut in each one of these that made the minor diameter smaller. The minor diameter would be smaller, but the pitch diameter would still be the same. So when we use like a thread micrometer, we'll grab a couple in a minute. When we use a thread micrometer, we're always measuring pitch. So you'll have, um, I'll do my best to use every color today. Um, when you have a thread mic, you're going to go in, and it's got this, and then it's got like this for the anvils. And as you screw it into it, the thread pitch, it's, it's, it's hitting on the pitch diameter of it, or should be hitting on the pitch diameter of it. So essentially, I could, I could turn my major diameter down to 490, as long as my pitch and my minor are still good. My thread's still good. Um, you may notice it a little bit in the fit, uh, but really pitch is the thing that we're paying attention to um, primarily because that's really, it's really what controls it. All right, so then on the inside of this, you've got one, two, and three B. Your Bs are always going to be your internals. Okay, so if you're tapping a hole or internal threading, that's a B thread. The minor diameter, so the hole that you drill or bore, is going to be these two in the min and max here. So, like, if you were to tap this, um, 421 would be a nominal drill for it. 417 to 434, um, 421 fits inside of there. Pitch diameter, 450 to 459 and 7 tenths is going to really be something that's hard to measure. Um, Really, if you're going to measure internal pitch diameter like that, um, it can be measured in CMM. I'm sure that there is an internal thread mic, but what a lot of people do is they'll do um, a wax mold. So they pour wax into it, let it set up, unscrew it, and then measure it with the wax. So they make a, they make a uh, measuring wax that you use. So we used to have some parts that we did that were um, a really small tube and it had a bunch of grooves and different things inside of it and it was impossible for us to measure. And so we would put some a paper towel down at the bottom, pour the wax into it. And it was kind of like a, it was kind of a, it was almost rubbery. And you let it set up and then you pull it out and then, then you can measure all the diameters and stuff on it. So it returned back to the way that it was. Um, we made, we made um, ejection seat booster tubes um, to go in like jet ejection seats, and um, we made probably a thousand of them and never made a good one. It had, they were like this long, 80 thousandth wall tubing, concentricity with like two tenths of the whole length of it, two tenths tolerance throughout the entire thing. It was terrible. But one of our owners was like, hey, we really want to make these parts. There's only two companies in the world who make them. We want to make them. And I was like, okay. So I spent two weeks working on it. And then I come back in. I go, there's a reason why only two companies in the world make them. And um, we ended up talking to the company who, who, who owns them. And they're like, oh, yeah, the people who we, – we didn't think you'd be able to make them. There's the, company that make, the companies that make them, they have specialized machines that do just that. I was like – could have led with that information, you know, and they're like, hey, you quoted it, you're right, we did. So um, that, was a, that, was, that was on us. 
So this, this chart will take care of all of your thread information for 90% um, of all threads. Now this, there's always the bastard thread that is not quite, it, you can't be, it can't be found on the chart. So that's where you've also got some calculation um, formulas on these pages as well. So any type of odd ball, one-off threads, um, you'll be able to use the chart that says, well, if the major diameter is this and the threads are this and the pitch is probably this, and here's how you figure out the minor diameter from those things. Generally speaking, when you want to create internal threads, you need to have some type of male gauge to, to take care of it. So if you're making both sides of it, you always make your external threads first because they can be the, they can be the gauge for your internal threads. So say you're making the bolt and the nut, make the bolt first, then you can use that as the nut. What is not a gauge is a hardware bolt or nut. So I have had, in, in the 20 years that I worked in the shop, I would have new guys come in and they thought that they were really quick. And so that they would, they would say, I don't want to have to use thread wires or thread mics or anything like that. So they would leave after, after they did some threads after that day, and then they'd go to Westlake's and they'd buy every bolt size and every nut size and come back in the next day and they'd be like, check out what I did. I'm like, that's awesome, it'll get you close. And they're like, no, 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 look, all it's gotta do is fit on there. I'm like, right, but the tolerances for a hardware store bolt are not the same as a machined screw or, or, a, or threaded hole. And so they're like, look, but it fits. I'm like, but look how loose it is on there. I'm like, you don't, you don't want that to hold it you know, something over your head, you know, you want to make sure that it's really, that's good and right. Okay, so let me give you a couple to do. All right, if I'm going to do a 7, 8, 9, 2A, what is my major diameter? 7 8 9 thread is pretty coarse on the on the pitch. So what would you make? What would you turn the outside of that part? Anywhere between those two numbers? Right. I would try to find the nominal in that. So on the 789, we got 873 to 852. Um, so probably somewhere around about, like if it were me, I would probably try to find something nominal to it as well as a normal number. So probably 865 would be my number on that uh, middle. And so my pitch diameter would what would be the nominal on my pitch diameter? Or close to nominal? Eight. Seven, eight, nine. Let's see. Nominal between eight hundred and seven hundred and one, so. Okay, so if I'm doing a 1A, uh, nominal is between, on pitch diameter, it's between 791.4 and basically 801. So I could be... What's the difference in your class? Okay, it's a great question. So your class of fit just determines, if you look at it, um, so for 789, you get... You get less tolerance as you go. So here you get 873 to 852. Now you get 875 to 861. 8028, 798, and then 800. So you have almost 9,000 here, and you have about 6,000. Sorry, uh, three, three to four thousand there. So as the number gets higher, one, two, three, the tolerance gets tighter. So if I say it's a, if I say we need to make a 789-3A screw thread, is that an OD thread? Is that an ID thread? 
and A's would be an OD thread. It would be an OD thread. And then that would be a tighter tolerance on that. Generally speaking, we're going to give you guys twos for everything. Um, it's not too loose, uh, but it's also not really microfine as far as tolerance wise. Okay, so what if I needed to make a uh, three quarter thirty two? I need to make I need to make internal threads. What am I going to drill it or bore it to? Now let's say it's a two. Let's say it's a two on the size. Just go to your major. On so this is going to be an internal thread that I'm talking about now. Right. So my major would be what my my threading tool is going to go out to. So I can't drill it or bore it that size. You want to go to minor. Got to go to minor. So I have students oftentimes I'll say quarter twenty tap and they'll drill it a quarter inch. And I'm like, you got no material anymore. You got to drill it 201, 201, 203 in order to get the um, quarter 20 threads. All right, so 3 quarter 32, 2 for the size. What am I going to drill it or bore it to? Okay, so what would you consider nominal to be on that? Well, the way you talk, you want it to be a standard size? I would like. Yeah, about 720. You want to find something close to the middle, and and a round or even number is is pretty is pretty good. You don't want to have to try to remember in your head. Um, I got to make this thing 839 and 7 tenths. Let's just go to 840 if that's if that's the thread size that we're working on, because uh, you've got the range to do it in. And some people will go to the high side of their minor diameters on internal threads, low side on their major diameters. You ensure fit that way. Um, but you you also, you may not necessarily be giving the customer what they want, or you might be the customer. But you, know, you want to make sure that you get that nominal Manila Road allows you the variance in case something goes wrong. You want to build in, how do I, how do I make sure that if I'm off slightly in my measurement or I take a pass and it's got a little bit too much tool pressure, takes more, takes less, how's it going to work? So we've got that one. And then pitch diameter, we're either going to run a tap through it, um, we're going to roll form it, we're going to uh, single point it. This is going to come out. We're not going to be able to measure that one. We're going to bring it out, and then it's going to come out close to major diameter. should be close to about 750. On that, but that would be unmeasurable on. So it'd be like you can't measure the major diameter of a nut because you can't get to the, the major diameter of the threads of it. Everybody with me on that? Unless you use the wax. Unless you use a wax or some type of gauging, or you cut it in half. Like if you wanted to do something that was a destructive test, cut that baby in half and check it. I mean, that's why we use a lot. I'll go grab, I'll go grab a couple, I'll go grab a couple thread mics, anyways. So we've got several thread checking options. So on the internal side, you've got a go no go gauge. So if it goes in here, it's great. If it doesn't go in, it's good. But you can you can still have a bad thread and and make it. So if you if you go too wide. Like you make the hole too big and the thread's too big, this go will still go in it and the no, but and but the no go will go in it. But you could kind of land in a realm that 
isn't, it's not quite bad, but it's like borderline. You shouldn't be able to shake this thing in there, you know? Um, generally, if you have to convince yourself that it's right, you, it's probably not right. You know, if you're going, I think that's probably okay. And, if, and you call your buddy over, hey, do you think this is okay? I don't think it's okay, but I want you to say yes so that I'll, I'll feel better about it. So generally, that's a good way to know that it's probably not right. Okay, so then we have, for external threads, we've got some great gauges like this. These are not dinuts. Um, and that thing is a little, the other one is it's easier to read. That thing, I was like flipping it. We did the, the top of the rocket. You can tell, but. Exactly. So again, on this one, you can have threads that are smaller. You can also probably crank down on that. Right, and this will still fit on it. But you know when you're going clunk, 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 you're like, that can't be right. But if it's, yes, it does. But you, you also know that it's not right. So um, if you're working on something that, you know, screws into it, fits pretty good, not a lot of shake in it, then you can say, okay, I feel pretty confident about that. So there, every gauge has some subjectivity to it. And you can manipulate about any kind of gauge that you want. That's why I discourage the use of full-time calipers for everything. You can make them say whatever you want. You're, you're a little too big, squeeze down a little bit. You're um, a little too small on your diameter, don't squeeze down as hard. And so that, I mean, that happens. We used to have at our shop, uh, before we had automated CMMs, well, I mean, it's automated CMMs. But we used to have a, a machine that looks just like a CMM, but you manually moved it. You guys have one. Yeah. Um, so that's all we used to do all of our measurement, all of our digital measuring. And so we would have big boards. We did a lot of like 20 inch board type stuff. And so you go in and measure it six times and then it would calculate the diameter. And if it measured it too big or too small, let's say it measured it um, too, too big. So then you would adjust the amount of hits that you took. Or if you wanted it to go bigger, you would hit it, you would go into it a little bit harder. And you could you could really manipulate those those things. Now the customer, all they wanted was the report. And so we could get a good report. And by just you know, push into that thing, and I mean you're just changing it by tenths. But um, and and honestly, functionality, when you're talking about a 20-inch diameter. Functionality of tense doesn't mean much, you know. Because there's a lot, there's a lot of surface, and and when you have that much area, you typically have much more clearance. And so we were dealing with things that had. It's just the engineer getting, you know. Yeah, a little overzealous. Application. Yeah. Yeah. So we had some parts that we made all the time, and um, the outside of them were was 22 and a half, plus or minus one. I've told the story a thousand times. And so um, I was over at the customer one day, and I mean, we had made these for years. Hardened, D2, interrupted cut, takes hours to just turn one of these diameters this long. And so I'm over at the customer one day, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching the die run, and I was like, D what's that locate in? How do you locate that? They're like, oh, we don't locate that. They're like, we, it just sits out in space, and we drive, we bring the, we bring the punch down over it, center it up through it, and then tighten it down, pull it out, and then put the windows and stuff into it. And I'm like, so that 22 and a half area doesn't do anything at all. He's like, no. I was like, did you know that it's plus or minus one on your print? And he's like, not surprised. And so, man, we ran back to the shop, or I ran back to the shop, and I was like, cut these things to size for now on. No more. We always had two or three of them running through the shop at, at any given time. And they were like, no, 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 man, it's plus or minus one. I was like, Hangs out in space. And so we actually, they were not to print, but no one ever said anything because we knew functionality. It wasn't an issue. It was a little bit of an internal struggle for us because we knew we were shipping a part that was not to spec. But we had done business with this company for so long. I mean, we cleared it with the engineers. They were like, look, we're not changing the prints. We've, we've been using these prints for 20 years. We're not changing the print. And they're like, okay. And so we made sure that they were okay with it, we were okay with it, you know, and, and everything else. But, I mean, the, the, the machining market is pretty competitive, and so if you could save a couple hours here and there at $60 an hour, you know, you're saving a couple
couple hundred bucks off of a par. But the benefit of being able to go out there and get that information, it's not It's huge. But the problem really was, it, you sh and, and, and yes, it was an advantage that I was able to stand there that day and see that. Uh, but, but also, we had made them like that for 15 years before that. And, um, but, but the problem was that the engineer should have put the appropriate dimensioning on that part for its application. And what they did is they do, um, I mean, it happens to me all the time. When I do a two-place decimal, it automatically bumps it up. So if it's 375, it says 380. And so they had a default in their AutoCAD settings that just went and said, um, anytime you got three-place decimal, like you're going to trail it out like 22.500, we're automatically going to make it plus or minus one on the tolerance. And so they should have did change it. So, um, but I mean, I told them, I said, hey, you can save yourselves thousands of dollars if you did this. They're like, not worth the paperwork to go back, engineering change and all that. They're like, it'd take us three years to get that done. We wouldn't save anything. For yeah. So, because this company, they were not drawing their parts here. Oh, they have. Yes. Yeah. So, like, right now, they draw all their parts in Brazil. So, that's not even a phone call that you make, right? You know? <laughs> so, it, it's just, it was, it was tough. Um, okay. And so, then, we have also um, thread micrometers. Right. So, thread micrometers is what I showed on the board. And so um, you've got you've got the point and then the, the the kind of negative side of it. And we're gonna take that and bring that into it's just gonna go into the grooves. Now again, every gauge has some subjectivity to it. So um, if I have to pull it off or I'm like, oh man, it won't go that way. Yeah, that's it. Nope, that's not it. Right? It's gotta go, it's gotta go over it. And I have seen Especially when you're on your third one and you're like worn out, you, you're you're willing to do anything, man. You will sacrifice an animal to get just is this, is this please tell me this part's good. Please tell me this part's good. So so sometimes you can get crooked on it. So you know, unfortunately, there is no way to identify that without just kind of looking over it and going. That's as straight as it could possibly be, which it can't be straight at all, honestly, because it's got pitch to it. And so, since it's got some pitch to it, it, it really can't. So, um, so thread micrometers are, they have a range to them. Um, so, it says, this this one is 10 to 13. So, if you're doing a half 20 thread, no go. This one is 20 to 24. 20, you're half 20, quarter 20, you got to take care of it. It'll be done on that one. So you've got those different options to look at. So um, there's several, several different ways um, to be able to, to measure screw, screw thread. Okay, so we'll do a quick flyover on the metric side. Um, if, you, if you've got the blue book, it's about 1949, 1950. I'm going to go try to. Uh, so there is a formula for threads you can't find. I'll jump up here and see if I can't find it real quick. It'll be before this, because you might you might encounter one that is is some type of a pasture thread, and it doesn't have um, it just doesn't have the the right information or or available information in it. Get up to past all these sizes. And depending on the thread, the formula is going to be slightly different.
to. Um, okay, so here we go. So on some of your threads, so I think this one is for a M style metric thread. It's going to be ratios versus diameter. So you're going to it's going to go a certain ratio to the diameter is the thread height of the thread width. Still 60 degree angle. Acme threads are going to have a different formula. Buttress threads are going to have a different formula. Uh, trapezoid threads are going to have a different formula. That's where you just have to look through the book, find the places where you need to be, uh, just knowing you're in about that 1800 section of threading. But I think for probably 80% of your threads in the common world, you're going to be able to look at the chart and go, So, and here you have just some metrics, so M20 by 1. Um, metric threads are just really, honestly, they've got a little more tolerance to them, and they're really just a little bit under, easier to understand. So, in 20, you have uh, your pitch is 1. Um, your class of the thread is 6H. And so, that, that's really a ratio. So, 6 and H make the ratio of the thread. You've got your major diameter, your minor diameter, and your or major diameter, your pitch diameter, and then, sorry, your minor diameter, your pitch diameter, your major diameter. So they're not varying in class? What's that? There's no class. So there, there is a class, but they're not class so one, two, and three, right. or A and B. Right. There's no difference. And, and here, what you're seeing is really no difference. But so, because like. Because they have. You can tell it goes up in what is that half inch or inch increments, like clear. Um, they, they, they're probably not half inch. Are you talking about the thread pitch? Thread designation. I'm just wondering, like, how are they getting away with it? just one tolerance? Is that, is that right? Is so one tolerance. So tolerance? that's one to That's that's in this tolerance category, six H. But so when you go into the metric side of things, you start to see all of your tolerances kind of change. It's really way smarter. So the bigger the part, the the, the designation will change. So it might be um, 9G. Okay, I'm just throwing, that's just a random one out there. Let's just say we're doing a board, not even a thread. 9G on the, on the tolerance for it. The bigger the hole gets, the more tolerance it gains. So you know by the letter and the number, then looking at a chart, how much tolerance you get for that. Even on metric, a lot of the metric um, tolerances, if this is two inches and this this hole that this is going to go into a hole, it will call this. Let's we wouldn't be two inches. Let's say this is 50 millimeters. It'll say this is 50 millimeters, but it won't. 50 millimeters doesn't work, right? So then it's going to, if you have a class designation, let's just say, because 6H is in our, in our brains, 6H is the class toler, tolerance for this. So that says that this needs to be, it says 50 millimeters plus 2 millimeters plus 5 millimeters. So see, both the tolerances are plus. So that means you can't make it 50 millimeters. It's got to be bigger than 50 millimeters. Same thing over here, the tolerance for it would most likely be a minus minus tolerance. So you can't make it 50 millimeters either. You gotta make it, let's just say we're making it 50 millimeters minus one minus three. So then it becomes 48 millimeters is what you're gonna make it to. But what where the advantage comes into, because the first time I saw it, I thought that's stupid. But what it clues me into is if I've got this 50 millimeter part and I know it goes into a 50 millimeter hole somewhere, 
I don't have to try to figure out what it goes into because it's got the same size. So as I'm looking for the things on the print, let's just say I'm building a die that's metric and I've got pins and bushings. Here's my pin, 50. I know that the bushing, I know that this is the correct bushing because it's 50 as well. So I don't have to try to line things up. I can go, oh, that's 50, this is 50. These two things go together. But on this tolerance for the bushing, it's going to be a plus plus dimension. On this tolerance for the pin, it's going to be a minus minus tolerance. And that's typically designated by a letter, uh, number and letter. On your prints, depending on where you work at, if your place is ISO 9000, you'll be really tempted to write on the print. Um, this is a minus minus tolerance, this is a plus plus tolerance. Are you guys ISO? Um, do you do international work? A little. Okay. So we were an ISO stop, shop, so we did the international work. So we had a controlled document that was stamped on our print. Could not write on the print at all. Okay. So what we would have oftentimes is reference prints. I think that's what we have. Those were all, they were all, yeah, all marked up. Yeah. Just previous people who had run the parts before or the shop manager came in and said, these are going to be potential problems for you. I'm going to go ahead and mark this all up so that you know what to do. But then that wasn't the control document that went with it to QC. So you got to have, you had to have that document unwritten on to go to QC. So we would have a lot of problems like this because we were such an inch shop. And then we would go get some German parts or something that was clearly metric. And we were like, we don't know what any of these things say. Uh, the internet was barely a thing at that time, and so we were just handwriting out everything on it. Um, later on, we got way better at it. So, in talking about tolerance, let's just talk about some GD and T real quick. And so, GD and T is really covered in a class. Metrology. Are you in metrology now? And or I went you through. you already went through it. So, when we're in geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, it's it's one of those things that people think are uh, that's going to make life harder or it's going to make me make parts harder or they're more difficult to machine. It actually makes parts easier to machine. What gd &T actually works off of is form fit functionality. Does the part still work? Does the part work for the thing that I'm working on? And, and that's really where a lot of things come into play. That's where we start to build datums like uh, our primary datum, our secondary datum, and then our tertiary datum. So if this is where this thing sits down and it nests in like this, primary, secondary, tertiary, A, B, and C, or how it sits down into a pocket. Now, if this thing, let's just say this face had a dip in it, it would still work, right? Is it nested down into a corner? It's same thing here. This could have a dip in it, and it would still nest into this corner. Now, if it had a, a bow in it, so GDT is really more concerned about form fit functionality um, as it is to actual dimensioning sizes. And so what it uses is things like LMC and MMC. And so MMC is the maximum material condition, and LMC would be the least material condition. That's also in this section between about 1800 to 1900 in the book. Um, and then it's also in just a general machining book. Least material condition means it has the least amount of material in it. Maximum material condition means it has the most amount of material on it. So what you end up with is a tolerance that says um, in GDT with your feature control frame, it might say you have a 5,000 tolerance on this OD at the MMC. So at the largest diameter, let's say the largest diameter that you can make it is three inches, and it's got a plus or minus five tolerance on it, so we can go up to three inches, five thousandths. At the maximum material condition, you have this for your tolerance. So if you need more tolerance, you make the hole or you make the diameter smaller. So what you see, so think about it like this. If you have a um, let's say you're you're gonna use a you're gonna do a uh, like a pentel style hitch to a, a trailer. Okay, so not a two-inch ball, but you basically got a hole and then two holes, and you're going to stick the pin down through it. All you care about is can I get 
this over this, and then the pin down into it, right? If it doesn't fit, what do you do? You enlarge the hole so that it fits. Once it has form, function, form fit functionality, you're good to go. It's the same thing here. If you have, let's just say you have a four holes that you machine on a part, And you guys who are in metrology um, or who are going to be doing metrology, you'll talk about more of this when you are in there. So let's just say okay, so I've got four holes on this part, and everyone has the position of one inch by one inch. And each one of these holes are a half inch diameter. If one of these holes is out of position, let's just say this particular hole is actually um, 15 sixteenths, just trying to say those some fractions. So it's 15 sixteenths this way, but it's still one inch this way. Without GDT, if it's out of tolerance, I scrap this part. With GD and T, I can either move back to the correct position and enlarge the hole, or I could really just enlarge the hole and get it so that the thing that has four pins that stick out of it then fit into it. See, so normally you would go, okay, we are we're either going to scrap this part or we're going to bore this out bigger, put a pin, put a bushing in it and then rebore the hole. gd &T says, we don't actually care about that. Can you make that hole fit the pins by enlarging it or enlarging and changing the position of it? Yeah, I can do that to do that. It's actually way better for you to live in the gd &T world. We have not, in 101, all I want to do is get you familiar with the terminology of things like gd &T. As you take metrology in, we move into 102 and 117. We'll talk much, much more about things like feature control frames. By the time you hit 104 and 119, gd feature control frames will be, you know, like we're just doing, we're just doing applesauce and, and smooshed up peas right now. So we'll get, we'll get into, we'll get into some other stuff right now. So, um, and, and, you know, like I did with my kids, I'm going to eat half the, half the applesauce. I'm not eating any of this mess up eats. So. so, maximum material condition, least material condition, um, those things are all important factors for you to think about in sizing. Because um, one of the things that we saw, and as soon as this happened the other day, I, I started to rethink some things. Eric made some of the bushings for the police. And I know he went into it thinking, I'm pretty awesome. I can see it. Oh, you want me to make some of those? I'll make some real quick. I was like, go ahead. <clears throat> Form bit functionality became much more important. The hole was bored. You have to make the thing correctly or else it's not going to fit. It's not going to have functionality. So, um, I mean, he made, it was, he's on a five to one ratio. Five scrap for one good. And it got so bad that we took his last ones and we were like, let's leave these. We'll bore the other parts to fit them now. Because, but, but his problem was his hammer handle, he made well. His hammer head, he made well. His other things that he had done were intolerance. Like, like he had every reason to believe that he was a machining stud until he got his legs swept out from underneath them on the part where you really had to put things together. So I actually came back and I said, hey, we should relook at some of our projects in 102 and do some, some press fitting. Um, I typically stay away from it because I don't like to press things. Is that where you <clears throat> press fitting the, the uh, tube or the punch that punch that? No. No, that one was already there. That's typically how you make um, and that one, there, there are like nine safeguards built in so that we can make those parts and not have terrible.
terrible problems with it. So we've got the option to straighten neural. We've got the option to um, lock tight if we need to. Uh, we can braze them in there if we need to. We can put set screws in there and roll pins and dowel pins if we need to. The goal is to not have to do that um, because you're doing, you're going to be doing continuous beating on it. It needs to fit together. But it does help you to start to feel what it's like to put things together, you know. Because um, you, you just don't know until you know. And boy, a tenth can make a big difference on a small part. And, and you wouldn't think it would. You know, we've had parts that had to be all put together at 68 degrees, or else they would not go together. And um, so you sit, sit in the QC room for 24 hours, all the parts go together perfectly, you take it out to the shop and let it sit for an hour, and you can't get the pieces back out. Big tents are like that big. I got a few tents taller. So right. Ship them out to South Dakota. They get up there. They don't grab the tolerance. Yeah. It's Climate differences. Yeah. Everything. Everything changes. So that's why typically um, the standard for QC temperature is 68 degrees. Um, when, when you're measuring everything 68 degrees, it makes for a cold QC room. Um, but it's the standard, so that means if I make it here and it's checked it good at 68 degrees, I can take it to China at 68 degrees, it should still be the same thing. Now, if that doesn't fit on the floor, that's an engineering issue. We need to, we need to start working back through some of those things. But, yeah, I mean, those really tight tolerances, when you're talking about tense tolerances on something like that, uh, <laughs> surface area becomes a huge, huge, huge thing. So, okay. Um, let's jump over real quick, and so I'm just kind of bounce around just a little bit on some things. So we've talked about some threading, um, and a little bit about form fit functionality and some uh, least material condition and maximum material condition. I'd like you to now, I feel like you have a decent handle on a normal OD micrometer, and I'm just going to continue to encourage you to use that normal OD micrometer as often as you can, rather than going to the caliper. The caliper is great to about five thousandths. I don't care if you're using the digital caliper or if you're using um, a regular, um, just a regular micrometer. Totally fine either way. Or I'm sorry, digital caliper or the dial caliper. But when you get down to something that is a critical dimension, the sooner you get into um, Use the micrometer, the better you're going to be. Okay, so I think all of your depth micrometers are pretty close in the way that they work. Um, they've got a little lock on them. They've got the thimble, and it, you'll probably immediately notice that the increments on it or the markings on it are backwards from um, a normal micrometer. So on this, uh, a normal micrometer, you read what you see. On this, you read what you don't see. And so... If you have this interchangeable anvil style micrometer, my suggestion is to bring it down close to zero. And then all you do is got a little ring on it. It goes into a, a groove. You just push it in to the hole and you'll feel it bottom out. And then, so go ahead and put your smallest rod on there. And then from that point on, you can bring it out and you should see that rod move or spin. It may not spin, but it should definitely move back with it. Um, okay, yours is slightly different. So yours is like this. You're gonna take the head off of it, put it in like this. This that's how mine are. So same thing though. You're gonna just watch it as it. Uh, with it and zero to one. I really like those better. Um, the thing I don't like about these is sometimes people will get, like they'll get these things jammed in or not in all the way and um, and they'll measure something and they're like, it's like 120,000, thousandths off. And you'll go up to the rod and push it in all the way and they're like, oh, okay. So typically it saves their part though. So what you want to do is every time that you grab an, anything, that's, especially if it's interchangeable handle, that has zeroed out every single time. So your best opportunity is to take it to the granite table, 
and bring it down. This is obviously not a granite table. It's not even a granite look like a table. But you will bring it all the way down on a granite table. Make sure that it zeroes out. I would give these about a 5 tenths tolerance uh, before you go and change a lot of things on them. Um, on the ones like this that you are pushing the rods in themselves, there's no adjustability on it. Okay, so you change it by rotating the head. Here's the problem with that. If your zero to one rod is not the same as your one to two rod, then you have to remember every single time that you change rods, you'll have to zero it out. That's why I'd give it about a five tenths tolerance on there. On the one like you have, you adjust each rod, never adjust the face, and then every rod will be right. And um, so that, that's how that's how 90% of them are. I, I, this is the first time I've ever seen, when we bought these, this is the first time I've ever seen this style. Um, like if I had this as a set for my own, for myself, set like this, I like the speed of this, but I would probably find myself setting these things up on the service grinder and grinding them, trying to grind them in so that I didn't have to adjust the head every single time. Everybody have theirs close to that hour less to each other. A bunch of stuff on the end of it. zero out or close to zeroing out. If you need to adjust it, I don't want you to think that you can't adjust it. I'm just saying I don't want you to get adjustment happy on it or you're adjusting it all the time. Anybody have one that need major adjustment? Okay. So I've given you a part it's got two different steps on it. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to set this micrometer on top of this. We're going to feel across the top, give a good positive pressure, go down in the middle of that slot, and we're going to just bring it down. And then the danger in the ratchet is that you can start to crank it. So when you if you go down to the ratchet, you hit the ratchet like one or two clicks. Like don't, because you can start, depending on how much pressure you have, it can start to work like a jack. You know, it starts to jack the thing up. So now you're going to put it down on there, uh, get it to where you want. You can lock it down if you want to, then take it off. On these style, so red box ones, you you have the whole numbers being 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000. And then you have a 50,000th mark at the bottom. Above it, you have the 25,000th marks. Here's what I don't like about that. It reminds me of a metric micrometer. And it makes me, yeah, it makes me want to try to read it like a metric micrometer, but it's not. Now yours is probably just like a normal micrometer. Yep. Um, close. It's got numbers high and low, but um, it does make it just a little harder to read. All right. So we know. Um, so mine landed on. So I can't see the one, right? So I know it's more than 100,000 feet. 
or I assume that you can't see the one on yours. Now you can see the two, right? So it's, it's between one and two. On mine, um, I'm just beyond that halfway mark at 150. And so I'm 1,000 beyond that. I'm 150, 1,000 people in the group. 156. 156. Yeah. What's that? 175. 175. Oh yeah, yeah, you're you're definitely you're deep. <laughs> So yeah, I got I got just a little bit more than that, but yeah. So I got I got one I got one eighty five pretty much. I got one seventy five, one eighty, one eighty five for my depth. Uh, you have one eighty four for your depth. So. Um, this is 175. Uh, yeah, so this is 175. Yeah, and then your to here. Okay, so then yeah, so that'd be the eight, and then you're just counting out the eight. So is it point one seven five eight, or do you add the eight to seventy eight? One seventy eight. So you're just counting out one seventy five. Well, I'm sorry, it's it's uh it's 175, 176, 177, 178. So you add the you're eight. adding. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you're just adding it to it. Okay, so let's measure the next step on there. A little bit deeper step. Same end on your micro offer though. So I have passed three hundred and Fifty thousandths. What's that? Outside edge. Yeah, outside edge. I'm 352. Nope, sorry. I'm 377. Is it better to turn it like this? No, I would say perpendicular to it, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be easier to read, but it would only read in... Well, no, I think it would be an accurate reading, but it would be... Um, it'll only measure in that one-inch increment. Oh. Unless you're changing the rods on the end of it. Did you change the rods on the end? No, it was just a... Just right up there and slide it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The problem with it was, it's like, you don't want to get it. If you didn't have your hook, you were pulling up, you're putting pressure, pulling up to get the, a false bearing. Right. But you can only slide a drop strip if you had that thing right. Yeah. Like this thing, you could have stuck it down and it would have worked. Right. Yeah, so like a dial, uh, dial indicator face is really nice because it's pretty easy. But again, typically a dial indicator like that, a travel indicator, only reads one inch. So if you could extend it by putting ends on it, um, but yeah, it's way easier than reading the micrometer. And I think on a dial indicator like that, I think it probably has the same amount of accuracy as this does. This is accurate to a thou. That would also be accurate to a thou. Um, if you need something higher than that, like this does not have tenths on it. So, uh, and really, if I need to measure tenths, I'm probably going gauge blocks and height gauge to do something like that. Okay. Feel good about that? What's that? I had 170 something. What'd you have? Well, if you're one if you're one is deep, then oh I'm sorry. No, I had three something too. Um, yeah. Pretty shallow. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about the other one. So I'm at uh, Three seventy seven. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Three seventy seven, three seventy five ish. 
376. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so on that, I think on that project, it's 375 for the depth around the outside. It's 150 for the depth of the other part of it. So then when you're done with that, um, you can... You can always, like, I think for mine, I think I always leave my zero to one rod in micrometer. Um, all my other ones, they're, they're too long, so I don't leave any other ones in there. Whenever you put a gauge away, it's going to be really good to just take, clean that thing off, put a little bit of gauge oil on it or something. We've got several, several tubes of gauge oil in um, the PMI box. Uh, if you got, you know, Fingerprints that are known to be rusty. What's that? What's a PMI box? It's uh, it's for metrology. It's the it's a box. There's a, there's a toolbox in the third classroom that's got a whole bunch of gauge oil tubes in it. Okay, let's take a quick look at some of our questions that are going to be on. All right, so this is a quiz that you're going to take, and I think it's worth 18 points. Let's just look at a couple of questions on it. Class blank fits have little to no clearance between the mating threads. Class three. Class three. All right. So it's it's getting uh, it's the tightest of the tolerances on there. I guess class three is the tightest one you can give. I I don't know. I guess so. I mean, it's the it's tightest one I've ever seen. seen. Yeah, probably commonly seen. Um, Probably when you get into ground threads and some of those really, like um, ball screw threads, probably a much tighter tolerance on that, but I don't, I don't know. Um, here's a question that I think could be potentially problematic. Um, two main types of starter drill bits are blank drills and combination drill bits. Um, so typically, what would you spot drill? Spot drill is typically, you could really use a spot drill or a center drill um, in starting on a hole. Let's just take a look at it. Uh, spot drill is what it's looking for. What do you need? Um, on this ring hole, do we have a D drill at all? Um, or find what we have that is closest to it. Closest to it? So a quarter inch? Or? Uh, um, you're reaming at a quarter inch. Yeah, that's what I you? thought. So you younger keep, is, so. keep reaming at a quarter inch. So I need to be at 0.246 D. Hmm. I'll see if I have a loop without a D drill. Yeah. I just want to make sure before I got it. Yeah. Okay, question six on this one. Um, going back to threads, the valley between the thread, uh, between the threads, the, the blank is the valley between the threads and creates the point from which the minor diameter is measured. So on your threads, you have this kind of form. Probably a better drawing in your book on what it's going to look like. A more detailed drawing. So you've got, we talked about the minor diameter, we talked about the major diameter, we talked about the pitch diameter. Um, this is often also called the root. Um, here you have the crest. And then from high point to high point, or low point to low point, this is also called the pitch. Okay, so there's two two phrases that are pitch. One is pitch diameter. One is pitch of the thread. Like 13 threads per inch is the pitch. Now on the on the metric side of things, um, it, you don't have to try to figure out what the pitch is. So 
like if this is a 20 threads per inch, the pitch is 50 thousandths because one divided by 20 is 50 thousandths. If you're in the metric world and the pitch is 1.25, it's 1.25. So it's already telling you what it is. Ours are saying how many threads per inch for the pitch. Um, so one divided by the threads per inch gives you the pitch. Okay, yeah, the valley between the threads, uh, or blank is the valley between the threads and creates the points from which the minor diameter is measured. So it would be the probably the root of a thread, the lowest part of a thread. So it's kind of the valley in the thread. The blank is the largest diameter of the thread. Major diameter, no matter if it's internal or external, it's the major diameter of the thread. Okay. So those are questions regarded, regarding threading. And then the other one is a machinery handbook and measuring quiz. It's got a download for, um, it's got a download for the machinery handbook right there. It also has it at the top of your thing. So questions are coming from this as far as the answers are going. So it says using the machinery handbook, provide the information for this part. Two A threads, so this is external threads, right? You're gonna put the major diameter, minor diameter, pitch diameter. Same thing for these three here. Choose the best answer for this one to two micrometer. Um, the best that you can see it from where you are located, what is the answer to that, do you believe? You can move. Both your chairs have wheels and you have feet. So. Five hundred sixteen thousand. Okay. One to two. One it's a one to two. So one, yeah. So you've got. So we 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 put those questions on there because it says specifically on a one to two micrometer. Okay. And so when you go to take your NIMS test, it will ask those exact style of questions. Okay. So the answer is not down there, or what was the answer? You said one to two. It says look at the top. Choose the best answer for the one to two micrometer. You automatically know which one. Cut the inch. corner out. Right, so it's 1.516, right. right? Is that the answer? It's 1 inch, 516,000. Yeah, I know. I know the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so you all are saying the same thing. I just... Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I cut the corner out on purpose because, yeah, it's just, it's it's easy to go. Oh, 516, go. That's what everybody keeps saying, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you Put just a 516 answer in there. I, I think I do on a couple of them where I've put it. But so that's the clue. Though if you if you don't know the answer or you're waffling between the answer, if there's an answer on here that says 516.516 and then 1.516, you know it's got to be that because they're trying to get you to choose the 516 answer because that's the easy one. Or maybe not trying to get you, but at least they're throwing the bait out there for you to do it. So whether it's this or that, if you double click on the picture, it will zoom it in. So you can, like PMI is the same way. I have students do it all the time. I'm seeing them like do this and I'm like, you, you can just double click on the picture and they're like, ah, that makes it much better. But again, even this, it's it's a little subjective, you know, because I mean you're going like you want the you want the micrometer to look at so you can actually see it. Choose the best answer is what we're typically saying on answers like this. I have to personally grade these. So if you put something, say it's it's 118,003 tenths, and you put 118,004 tenths, not a, it's not a problem. I mean if you put 482 thousandths, that's a problem. Okay, so there's not very many questions on that. Just five questions, I think, is all on, on that one. So all I'm looking for you to, to be able to find is how to find information in the machinery handbook in regards to threads. 
and then do a couple quick um, measurement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can take them. Yeah. Um, let's see. Then here is the study guide for measurement materials and safety. So measurement materials and safety is it is just the most common things that we've covered in the book um, by the quizzes we've talked about in the shop. A couple things that can potentially get you. Um, some of these tests don't get quite updated at the same time as the terminology in the shop or in the industry gets updated. So like it could say things like MSDS. MSDS is actually SDS. So it used to be material safety data sheets. Now it's just safety data sheets because it contains things other than materials. Um, this gives you a really, really intense breakdown of, you know, kind of how the questions are asked, how what questions there are of things. It'll show you. Um, so it shows on machine maintenance. Um, there's four questions. It totals 7.9 percent of the test. Okay, on this one, I'm going to say you need to plan to get an 80% or higher. This is just a study guide, that's all this is. So you can print this thing out, or you can just write the answer down on a piece of paper. It's got the answers at the end of it. So if you print it out, it's a ton of pages. Okay, it's a ton of pages. Um, then it's got some milling process uh, questions. It's got some grinding process questions. Um, now, some of those things we have not done. So we have not got to the mill yet, um, but it's also in the book. We there is a, in the book there is a section called measurement materials and safety, and so it's not asking you specific milling questions like how fast would you spin this end mill feeding across this material. It's not that's not the kind of questions that it's asking. These are high level like like um, broad questions that it's asking you about things like that. Um, gauge blocks, especially if you've done metrology or you're in metrology, gauge blocks are going to be not a problem for you. Um, surface finish. Um, surface finish is in the book as well. Surface finish is, is gauged out by a couple of different things. Have you guys done surface finish yet in metrology? Yeah, you're in metrology. First five. Yeah, I don't think he does until after the first eight weeks. He does okay. a bit, and then at the end he does some more. Okay. Um, just to keep track of time today, I will not go over um, service finish and gauge blocks, but we'll go over service finish and gauge blocks. If not this week. Then but it's all of the categories on the actual MIMS test. It that's is. How it's going to be set up. What's that? That's how it's going to be set up? Um, not necessarily. But all of that influence. Uh, it will cover the bulk cover of that. these types of things. So PPE is going to ask what, when do you wear safety glasses? You know, what do you, you think is the most difficult part of this? Uh, answering the questions. <laughs> if you had to study something, which would you study? <laughs> um, the book. The yeah. Yeah. So what I so the quizzes have been tuned to match this stuff the best that they can. We're pulling questions right out of the chapter that's called measurement materials and safety. So in your machinery or your machining book, with the NIMS book, it's got a section that's called measurement materials and safety. That's where these questions are coming from. That's the that's where all your quizzes have been generated from. Um, I, I would not ever say that you could not get surprised by a question, but what I, what I would say to do is take what you know and then just apply it around it. Because, like, like, let's just say the question is, um, how many gauge blocks are in a gauge block set? Well, you don't actually have to know that. Huh? Yeah, or let's just say how many, in an 88-piece gauge block set, how many one-inch increment gauge blocks are there? It's in here, under the category of gauge blocks. Now, 
it is a little tricky because what it says is, let's say we've got an 88 piece gauge block set, and you're looking, you're hoping to see a, a chart that says there's a one inch gauge block, a two inch gauge block, a three inch gauge block, and a four inch gauge block. But what it says in, in the inch increments, there are four. In the half inch increments, there are 12. In the 100 thousandths increments, there are 22. It does not say, it does not give you a comprehensive list of every single gauge block that is in there. Because that's really not how gauge blocks are, are listed out. So when you look at your gauge blocks, and we can we can cover this one before too. So this is one that actually I think gets people a lot. And I think it's, I, I was surprised when I went to look at the gauge block section because I thought it would say, you've got a 50 thousandths gauge block, you've got a 100 thousandths, you've got a 101, a 102, 1013, 1014, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109. But it says in the 100 thousandths category, category, there are 25 gauge blocks or whatever whatever the set might have into it. So those are things to pay attention to. Um, fits and allowances. Again, if you don't, if we haven't covered that stuff, one, it was probably in a quiz. Two, it's in the machinery handbook. When you go fits and allowances, fits and allowances is a chapter in this book. So you can go and find fits and allowances. On there. Some of this is set up so that you will know how to do information location. So it's not it's not saying you should have been you should be able to regurgitate this piece of information or this fact. But what we care about because because otherwise we cannot cover every possible question that you'll ever have in your entire life. But we can give you the references. I know how to use the machinery handbook. I know how to do this thing. This thing is so so intense that there is a separate book called the guide to the machinery handbook. I have one. I see this, what you're saying, it's set number five, yeah. 21 block, but it's in inspection and then there's a, what do you call it when it's got like the, the table of contents at the front of the title. Right. Yeah. All of it is, is obtainable. There's nothing hidden in there. I mean, the machinery handbook's not trying to hide it from you. That would be that would be the, a poor choice in a book, trying to hide the information from you. So it's there. So you can take this, um, uh, and this is again, it's just paper, just a paper thing, or or you can write the answers down. You go all the way down to the bottom of it, and bingo, here are all your answers. No, I definitely don't think that. She said we can put. I said, I, I am not confirming or denying that you should or should not do that. What I'm saying is that I've had lots of students in the past. If if you walk into the testing center with Penny's book like that, that is not going to go because I can see that blue. Oh, okay. But. What happens is people will put information on post-its on the inside cover, just like that. You didn't do that. And, and, or they'll go into these sections and they'll take these things on there. They'll do, it, it's, it's smart. I got one book nobody uses. Yeah. 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 I mean, eventually these books are going to have all the answers in them for you. Um, so if you got a book from somebody who was a good note taker, I mean, that's like buying a used book. You know, some you, you just gamble on did I get good information or did I get somebody that wrote all the wrong answers in there or not? Yeah, you, know, use yeah, you, you, you can definitely reference it, but you could definitely use it as an advantage, but it's like the quiz where I got stuck on a question, so I went to Chisley and it's usually right. It's, it was wrong. Eighty percent of the time it's right. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it was wrong. I had to go through and find out the answer. Yeah, but quiz. The bad thing about Quizlet is so I used Quizlet one time. I, I found out two days before I had to go to some robotic training that I had to have this pretest done, and I didn't know anything about the robot yet. I had just been playing with it for like a day, and so I was like, oh my gosh, I leave like tomorrow to go to this class for Monday. So I I open up my computer, open up another computer, open up Quizlet, and do all the questions. 
get 100% on it. I look like a freaking robot stud. I walk in there, and they're like, hey, how many people took the pretest? And I'm like, yeah, that's a good. No one else answered. He's like, it's no big deal. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So he's like, let's just take it now. He's like, Justin, looks like you got 97%. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was like, hey, full disclosure. I Googled every answer, and he's like, why did you do that? I go, I didn't realize that we were going to be able to do it here. He's like, let's just retake it. And so we retake it. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm like an idiot, man. And uh, But I got super nervous because, like, these classes are pretty expensive. And, like, you're walking into a group of you have no clue where they're coming from. They can be robot experts, you know. And I was not a robot expert. But they did. They were very good. They, they, they took care of us really well. Okay, so that's module six. You've got all week to work on that. Um, I'll probably pull you back in. I know it's a short week, but I'll probably pull you back in and we'll, um, we'll cover a couple things like these blocks and some other stuff like that that we did. If you see a question that comes up that you're like, gosh, I'm really not sure about this. Can we bring this one to the group? Then absolutely we can bring it to the group and then we'll make sure we get it. I will schedule tests for... Um, you don't want to take it here in yeah, so we take it down at the testing center. You guys will. On that day, you won't even come to class. I'll, I usually schedule the test for about 8.30. You just go straight down there. You're welcome to come here first if you want to. Um, if you want to take your machine or handbook down there, you want to take a piece of paper, um, you want to take a writing utensil, uh, and then you want to take a calculator. If it were me, before I got down there, I would swing by here, I'd grab my machine or handbook, and I'd grab my machine Calc Pro, and take it down there. Can't have a phone. What week of, you know what week that is? I don't know. So I'm scheduling all the NIMS tests today. So it'll be whatever she can get in in the next week or so as we near the end of eight weeks. What week are we? Are we in week six? We're in week six. Seven. Yeah. So. Week seven and eight are really um, just kind of about finishing up projects and getting stuff done. You guys get done ahead. I've got an additional bonus project if you want to do it. If you don't want to do it, then no big deal. So we've got a tap handle that we used to make a lot. Um, and I used to do it early on as a project, and it, like, it was like suicide for people. So I moved it into an optional project um, for later on. But you do it or not, it doesn't make a difference to me. It's not a half and stop. Um, and so I'll get that scheduled. If you go down there and you don't have your ID, you will be turned away. If you go down there um, and you have not pre-registered for your NIMS test, you will be turned away. Okay. What's that? You, sh you should have already you should have already registered for NIMS um, at the beginning of class. We did that. We did good. Mm -hmm. okay. And so then we go in and, and do all the level one um, tests. Okay. <laughs> Everybody was in here at that time. Um, We'll, we'll just go back and, and do it and see if everybody's got it and say no. School ID or like? No. Okay. So, yeah. Regular driver's license. Okay. Just in the testing center? In the testing center. Yeah. And we're also supposed to be using Grant all in class. Yeah. That's on me. That'll be whenever they can get down here and do it. They will not present this for me. I, I would not say that. Yeah. But remember, those, those, the, the whole scholarship system is changing, yep. so it'll be different than what it was before. But um, Not before. <laughs> what's that? Not to before. Right? Well, it, it just depended. I mean, it just depend on how you how you did it. But um, so, okay, where are y'all at today on parts? Where you at? E treating. E treating. You're e treating too. Um, where you at? That's straight from my one piece. No way to e treat. Okay. Where you at? Plastic on the hammerhead, head, but it's way under. Okay, we we'll just get it even, and we'll move it across. Is the project the extra one for grade, or does, would it help if all your other stuff? Um, <laughs> yeah, I put it in there and do it. I mean, if you want to, if you want to do it, I'll I'll add it into the. Our my classes are always based upon a thousand points. So, uh, you know, I, I, it'll be a slight tweaking of the grades to get it in there. You just like your worst grades in the place. I don't need that. No? No. I'm not going to spend eight hours of... Oh, I just thought that would keep your thousand points even that way. 
Yeah, but so then I had to go turn things off and turn things on and recalculate. And so I got there, there is no magic button that does that. Yeah, no, I wish there was. So um, it's just like when we used to use things like commercial learning tooling. You, it it populated grades for you. It did not import them into Canvas, so we had to go out every single time, log into yours, find the one that you did, and it was just torturous, man. Is, is that immersion to learn stuff? Immersion to learn. Is that free to use or do you have to pay? So, um, yes and no. So we we've done immersion to learn for a long time. Um, we stopped doing it this year and started building our own. But because of a grant that we had, we went ahead. We were paid through for the year, so it is free for our students. So if you want to get into it, I can get you into it. Um, it's so here's why we went away from it. Uh, the material is pretty outdated. Yeah. So um, actually, the guy called me the other day and he goes, "Hey, just want to talk about what we're going to do for immersion learn next year." I was like, "You're still not going to use it again." I said, "Until you update your materials." I was like, "You're talking about things that we were doing about seven years ago." And I was like, "He goes, he goes, well, hold on, let me back up." He goes. It costs about four hundred thousand to to update those videos. I was like, I understand that. I said I also paid ten thousand dollars to just use your server space, so that we could customize ours. When I and when I customize them, they told me that I would be able to go in and manipulate their quizzes to update anything that I wanted to, but you could not do that. And so, um, anyways. So there's not really any real advantage. I don't think so. If there is something that I think is pretty updated, advantage stuff, um, and you would have to pay for this on your own, Tooling U, okay. they've got some pretty good stuff. A subscription costs like 120 bucks, and it's for 16 weeks. Uh, they've got, you can learn anything in there. It's got hydraulics, pneumatics, robotics. Um, it's got CAM. It's got all kinds of stuff. Um, and then you just take the class and you just answer the questions as it goes and read it to you. It's very much like immersive learning. Um, we found, though, just like anything, this, this honestly has been our best system that we're using right now. Because what would happen in tooling you and immersive to learn is everybody would wait until the last week. And they would freaking race through every one of them. And I'm like, but we're, we, you need to be doing the things while we're doing the things. And what they were doing is they were gambling. And they thought, if I can get 100% on my, my, my projects, and then if I can get 20% on my NIMS, I've got 70% already, and then I'll just do a couple of them until I can get up to my 80 uh, or whatever they wanted, and then they would quit. And I'm like, but the idea, you came here to learn, not to get a grade. Like, there's other schools you can go to if you just want a grade, but we're not, that's not what we do, you know? And so we fought every single time. I would literally, on the last day uh, that I would take grades, I would have kids text me all day long, hey, can you check my grade now? Hey, can you check my grade now? I'm like, you can see your grade, man. Like, you can do this. And they're like, I don't know how. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. And I mean, I just have to turn my phone off because they'd just be all day long. Ridiculous. But 